academic programs, deans of faculties, dean of students, dean of PhD school, the provost, the principal officers of our great university, the vice chancellors of the session.
of the University of Benin, the Vice Chancellor number one in Nigeria, as well as Africa's pillar of education. <laughs> Professor Chief Lilian Imwetiya Salami. Other principal officers of our great university, the provost, deans, directors, former vice chancellors, heads of educational institutions, the valedictory lecturer and family, professors emerita, and other distinguished scholars, your excellencies, top government functionaries, your royal highnesses, my lords spiritual, greatest universe staff and students. Invited guests, gentlemen of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Good morning as we welcome you to another epochal ceremony, which is the presentation of the seventh valedictory lecture of the great University of Benin. Please put your hands together for our university. This special lecture is to be delivered by one of our brightest and best, a professor of medicine and consultant cardiologist, Professor Austin Osemige of Basoha. <laughs> the title of this lecture is Evolutionary Changes in Medical Education and practice the universities and teaching hospitals systems a 50 year throwback. May I now invite the registrar of the university to introduce the vice chancellor and the vice chancellor's procession, Mr. Registrar. Thank you, Madam Vice Chancellor, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Kindly allow me to abide by the protocol already established by the University's PR. All courtesies duly extended. It is my pleasure and distinct honor at this occasion to present to us the principal officers of this university, names and directors who uh, follow the vice chancellor's entourage. First on this list, the PRO has said much about the vice chancellor to put the record straight properly. Let me say that the vice chancellor of this university was a former director general of a national institute, fellow of many distinguished bodies, both within and outside the country. Currently, the number one vice chancellor in the whole university system in Nigeria. We have over 251. She is the chairperson of the Committee of Vice Chancellor of Nigeria. I think I should say chairman because that's the position itself. So it's chairman. Whatever that means to the gender persons. Chairman Committee of Vice Chancellors of Nigerian Universities. Please let's give our Vice Chancellor. <laughs> the Vice Chancellor is also duly recognized in the whole of Africa and she is the Vice President, Association of African Universities, AUA. <laughs> I don't want to add so much. For those who are very conversant with this environment, you know there's a lot of con uh, transformation going on in the university, but she's, she has proved to be a very distinct leader since she has own duty as the vice chancellor of this university. So it is my pleasure and honor to present to this assembly the number one citizen of campus, Professor Lydia Imanti Salami. supported by very 
eminent scholars. First, Professor of Medicine and the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Administration, Professor Mrs. Catherine Obama. My fellow Pharmaceutical Society of Nigeria, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic, Professor Ray I. Ozono. Professor of Pharmacognosy, well distinguished academic in the mode of the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Ekenwa Campus. Ekenwa means so much to this university because it's a starting point uh, as far as the University of Benin is concerned. For those who are very familiar with our history, and today we have somebody who is leading, giving us a valedictory lecture who can really talk about this. Professor, B.A. and the Deputy Vice Chancellor of the The professor of this university, who is also referred to as Chancellor of the Exchequer, Dr. Victor Imagwe is here. The custodian of our books, publications, and research works, Professor Luke Obasi University Librarian. Or somebody I know who is so proud and very happy to mark today, along with a valedictory lecture, lecturer, is the provost of the College of Medical Sciences. And as you are aware, the College of Medical Sciences of the University of Benin stands very tall among such institutions, not just in Nigeria, across the globe. Professor Wilson Sado is the Provost of Medical Sciences. The Dean of Students, number one student on campus, don't mind me if I call him a professor, he is indeed a distinguished professor, but he's a student. And I bless him this time because of my office as my student. Professor A.C. Godaro, Dean Student Affairs. The Dean School of Mercy, too, who is also celebrating this day uh, because this big fish is running out of this uh, distinguished school, the School of Mercy. The Dean, Professor W. Osarogiabu, is also here. He's our host today, in addition to what Madam Vice Chancellor will also do. Professor E. R. Orwe is the Dean Faculty of Agriculture. The Dean Faculty of Arts, Professor S. C. Yuka. The Dean Faculty of Engineering, Professor E. K. Ogunjo. Dean Faculty of Law, Professor I. O. Omorui. The Dean Life Sciences, Professor Jerry Oroy. <laughs> Representing the Dean Faculty of Social Sciences, Dr. I. M. Agendo. <laughs> Professor Hassan Wahina is the Director of Center of Educational Technology. <laughs> the Director of a very promising Saint, I mean, Center of Advancement, call it the Advancement Office to raise funds for this university. Professor Eddie Erami. <laughs> the Director of Advanced Digital Engineering Center, a distinguished professor of engineering, a lady in that world, Professor Mrs. P. E. Orobe. Director of the Institute of Childhood, Professor Mrs. Sado. <laughs> Acting Director of the Institute of Education, Dr. Mrs. I. F. Yamu. <laughs> Director of IPAs in the Ekewa Campus, Dr. E. O. Mogato. <laughs> Dr. Mrs. I. Here is the Acting Director of Student Guidance Counseling. Mr. President, and leading the Vice Chancellor's procession is 
the Deputy Registrar said it matters, Mrs. Comfort in Gato. The senior ladies and gentlemen, it is my very distinguished honor to invite Madam Vice President. Award, 
which, with which he completed the remaining five years in the medical school in 1972. And as was the practice for the young school of medicine in the University of Benin, he proceeded to Amaru Benin University Zaria for his pre-clinical pre subjects and completed them in 1974 with a distinction in biochemistry. He returned to the then University of Benin in 1974 for the rest of the medical training and graduated in 1977 with distinction, winning various prizes and receiving commendation in most subjects and being the best graduating student also. Some of the prizes he won include Professor Kenneth Hill Memorial Prize in Pathology and Glasgow Prize in Child Health. He did his mandatory internship at the Specialist Hospital University from 1977 to 78 before proceeding to 5th Infantry Brigade Field Ambulance Nigerian Army Oweri for the compulsory National Youth Service from 1978 to 79. He thereafter started his residency program in the Department of Medicine, University of Benin Teaching Hospital, and finished in 1986. He possesses the Doctor of Medicine MD degree and has several certificates from training workshops in medicine and computer applications. <laughs> Professor of Azohandra in the services of the University of Benin in 1986 and won the Commonwealth Medical Fellowship for further training in cardiology in the University of Cardiff from 1988 to 1989. He rose through the ranks to the position of Professor on 1st October 1997. Thereafter, becoming the very first alumnus professor of medicine from the University of Benin. <laughs> he has had several academic and administrative positions within and outside the university. For example, he was head of the Department of Medicine, Hall Morning Hall Four, Chairman University of Benin Demonstration Secondary School, Chairman University of Benin Health Services Board, Chairman the Health Committee, Nigerian University Games Association, President Association of Resident Doctors, Chairman Medical and Dental Consultants Association of Nigeria, National Secretary, Nigerian Cardiac Society, and Vice President Association of Physicians of Nigeria, Chairman, in fact, this is an inaugural lecture myself, <laughs> Chairman Medical Advisory Council, Chief Medical Director from 1997 to 2003, Chairman of the Society, West African Postgraduate College of uh, Physicians, Member of the Court of Judges of Faculty of Internal Medicine, as well as other professional bodies than Professor Obasuma. When you have time to teach, I need to point you this man. Because he belongs to too many associations. He, he's a fellow West African College of Physicians. He's a fellow National Postgraduate Medical College of uh, Nigeria. He's a fellow European Society of Cardiology, fellow American College of Cardiology, fellow Royal College of Physicians, fellow Academy of Medical Specialists of Nigeria. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Professor Masa has also served as a standard examiner and professorial rank assessor to several universities within and outside the country. He has over 110 scientific uh, publications, both in local, national, and international journals, and has contributed chapters to several books. He has attended over 36 local and international conferences and has supervised over 30 resident doctors who are themselves now all consultants. <laughs> Professor Oba Soha is a recipient of several academic and professional awards, some of which, again, like I said, to cut the 
his uh, profile shot, Distinguished Service Award by the Edo State Chapter of the Nigerian Medical Association, Distinguished Service Award by the Nigerian NMA, Long and Distinguished Service Award by UBTH, Merit Award by the Association of Medical Laboratory Science Students, Best Lecturer in Medical Award by Unibank Medical Students, Merit Award by Medical and Dental Consultant Association of Nigeria, Award of Honor by the Nigerian Cardiac Society, Heroes Award by the University of Benin, Meritorious Service Award by the UBTH in 2023. Professor Omar Soha has passion for football and table tennis. He is a Christian and a Catholic Knight of St. Paul's. He's married to his sister, Olubumi Obasoha, and the union is blessed with five children. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is therefore my pleasure to invite the retired distinguished professor, Austin Osemiki Obasoha, to deliver this lecture. Our spiritual fathers, 
distinguished ladies and gentlemen. So this lecture is not going to be very technical. So don't worry, everybody will enjoy it. It's not going to be very technical. Let me start that and this lecture is dedicated to the Almighty who preserved me in good health and state of mind to bow up gracefully from active public service to deliver this lecture. May his name be praised forever. Amen. I also dedicate it to my family, nuclear and extended, who not only believe in my abilities and constantly hold me on, but show me immeasurable love. By the way, my other brother, Professor Emmanuel Obasma, is here. That's the seat reserved for him. Can you please move on to the front seat? Sir? He's my other brother. He's a professor of fisheries. And a retired dean from BIA. He's also a retired permanent secretary. I also dedicate this lecture to the university and teaching hospital communities whose interactions over the years generated the ideas on which this subject is based. And finally, to all who gave me a helping hand one way or the other. Madam Vice Chancellor, I thank you most sincerely for giving me an opportunity to deliver this valedictory lecture. The valedictory lecture is one usually given by an academician before his peers, to signal exit from active work, bid farewell to them, and place before them the experience of his time. It derives from the Latin word valedicere, meaning to say farewell. The word itself being a combination word from valere, the word, and dicere, to see. It gives an opportunity for a recollection of past experiences developmental challenges with a view to continuous improvement. The decision to give this lecture is a result of a resolution of forces of opinion. In physics, we talk about resolving forces. One on the side of walking away quietly as we are wont to do, and the other from the encouragement to deposit one's experiences and observations of the system with a view to further improvement. The latter was reinforced by the recent view of the university management that it is fit and proper that a professor discharges the body of not only giving an inaugural lecture but also a valedictory lecture to the university. No doubt it could serve as advisory to the system. However, for obvious reasons, the valedictory series have been few and far between, and the records show that only six professorial valedictorians have stood by this lecture to deliver their lectures. You know what? I guess you do. To stay so long in the system, to be in some state of health and mind, with both yourself and the system, it takes the grace of God. I stand here as the seventh valedictorian of this great university, my alma mater, and perhaps the first official of the College of Medical Services. Now, perhaps the first valedictory lecture ever recorded, or one recorded in the spirit of valedictory, was the address by Prophet Samuel to the people of Israel mm -hmm. in 1 Samuel 12, verses 2 to 3, where he stated, and I quote, and now the king walketh before you, and I am old and grey headed. And behold, my sons are with you. And I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Behold, here I am. Witness against me before the Lord, and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose ass have I taken? Whom have I oppressed? Or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind my eyes therewith? And I will restore it to you. Similarly, later, Apostle Paul in the New Testament, while delivering a powerful spiritual message to his folks, in 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 and 7, stated, and I quote, 
My time has come. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. So, so the spirit of valediction is well taken in the scriptures. Madam Vice Chancellor, as I prepare to hang my books literally in the theater of education and health, where I have played for nearly half a century, exactly for the city years, I reflect on the changes that are taking place in this sector during this period. Many of these changes have been positive, while some, perhaps a few, have been negative. The universities. I was admitted into the university system in 1971, having completed my school certificate in 1971. Take note, I said, admitted into the university system. Why? I was admitted into three universities, Tobago, Ife, now known as OU, and Bini, then known as MIT School at I will explain. I chose to go to the last for reasons I will explain later. There were only five registered universities at the time. You know them. The sixth university had just been established by an edit of the Midwest government of 1969 and commenced as MIT in bracket in 1970. Admission was tough and difficult. Each university admitted our own students. What was the standard route of admission? It was A level GC or HSC pass in three summer plus G, general paper. Graded A to E and scored appropriately for admission. High grade scores in three subjects the very, could fetch the very competitive courses, while a good pass in two subjects was GP could fetch admission to less competitive courses. The HSEA level was a two year full time course, very tough, and many students took an extra year to get the required grades to secure admission. However, there was a concessionary admission for very bright students who took a special university exam called concessional entrance, also prelim exam, also called prelim, to enter the university for a session of nine months to do the A-level subjects and provide for the discipline. It was concessionary for their knowledge and brilliance and was preliminary as they could drop out after the one session if they did not go. Quite a number dropped out actually, either to do A-level or repeat the year or be admitted to other less competitive courses. The examination was extremely competitive. Indeed, only a handful of students passed to the prelim directly from the school certificate. University undergraduates were few in the community, and when the admission list was published in the national dailies, it was big news and massive congratulations for the successful people. Look at that. MIT admits 133. Can you say it? Yeah. For 1971-72 course, it was published in July 1971. My name is there. <laughs> I also see a few people whose names are there. I wish I could increase it. Professor Kolova's name is there. <laughs> Professor Isabel's name is there. <laughs> so that was the way admission was. The admission system produced mature and bright university students who maintained high standards, not only in the academic affairs of school, but also in public affairs. Such was the caliber of students who prevented the Anglo-Nigerian Defense Pact which the Nigerian government wanted to enter into with Britain immediately after independence. I'm sure His Excellency is uh, very able to smile and remember his university days. There was okay. okay. There was clamor for the establishment of more universities, but the NUC of the time was reluctant and set very high standards for possible establishment of a new university. There were allegations of bias against minority ethnic areas in the universities that were largely established in the majority ethnic regions of the time, especially in admission to preferred courses. I applied for medicine to Ibadan 
but they gave me French name Agric or Forest. So I told them that. <laughs> I was admitted to Ife for medicine, but Ife was going through a sequential BSC route. So even after I paid the deposit, I told them that. I came to the University of Benin, where, anyway, we will get the rest of the people. Agitation for the establishment of the university in the newly created Midwest region, carved out of the Western region in 1963. More so, the University of Ife, created by the Western Government of Papua in 1962, was cited in the North Midwest area of the Western region. In addition to two already existing federal universities of Ibadan and Lagos, already located in those regions. So, Governor S. O. Governor set up the Institute of Technology Benin, which was to be degree awarded in the sciences only, medicine, pharmacy, and engineering, to beat the NUC policy, which made it difficult to establish a full fledged university at the time. The Midwest and the general public knew it was university status and degree awarding institution from the answer. It was partly the reason the press preferred the term MIT, Midwest Institute of Technology, with an acronym that reminded everyone about the prestigious Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston, USA, which though does not bear university in its name, is a prestigious and unique university. I have used MIT so far because that's what it was popularly called. MIT becomes so widespread that even many of the initial students believe that the name of their institution was MIT, even when their official documents all read Institute of Technology. So the real name was Institute of Technology Believe. However, the term MIT was very popular and everybody used to call it MIT. <coughs> I accepted admission into Benin, which though shorter than if it was a risk. What risk? Another selection exam for medicine for the limited number of spaces available to Benin students, as ITB had no medical school of its own. The first set of 20 students were already in Zaria. One of them is here, Professor Kepa. I saw him this morning. The second set, 25, were to be selected from the over 100 students admitted for concentration for medicine in my set. So it was a risk, leaving certainty in effect for medicine, for uncertainty in Benin, where you were to face another exam to be selected into medicine. I, I took the risk, as I was ready to take up engineering, if not selected, as that was actually my own personal preference, until counseled by the family. It was possible to read anything because all the FY students, irrespective of the discipline, took the same courses in all subjects and needed to pass them. So you did everything together, whether you were going to read engineering or read medicine. At MIT, ITV at the Kevin campus, name changed to University of the Heart. The only one then, the visit of Kano Bermuda, the pro chancellor. Mr. Edwin Clark came regularly to interact with the students. And the students pressured them to change the name to reflect the university due to the mentality of several Nigerians at the time. And they were particularly offended that MIT was being sandwiched amongst non degree awarding polytechnics and colleges of education, both in education and non educational matters. So the students were upset. The last straw that tilted the students was an advert for tertiary institution games where MIT was directed the authorities to conduct a referendum among the staff and students to determine the profession. ITB MIT or change to University of Virginia as proposed. The referendum held in 1972. Majority of staff and students voted for a change to the University of Benin, although I voted against it. Being satisfied with the name. I was satisfied with the name and my There's another gentleman who is here. 
Ibuna Obata Esquire. He was our classmate in FY. He also voted against him. <laughs> we were roommates and we were satisfied with him. But anyway, we lost. <laughs> Thus, on 31st March 1972, which was the end of financial year then, the governor visited us during his birthday speech, commencing 1st April 1972 announced the change of name to the University of Benin in response to the wishes of the generality of staff and students and the larger society. <laughs> Unibet. Admission to Unibet was initially only by constitutional entrance. First three steps. Into the foundation year, where the students took those subjects, as I said. The later, the five-term pre-degree and A-level HSE admission by direct entry was added. Though the University of Benin was the sixth of the first generation universities in Nigeria. After the successful establishment and takeoff, many of the older universities then decided to establish college campuses in different parts of the country to increase the spread and number of admissions as the acute need for more admissions was still pressing. It is not notable that before then, in spite of pleas to the University of Nepal to establish a campus in Benin, they, they did not do so. However, when the University of Benin had now been established and they took off, various universities decided to open up. ABU Zaria established campuses in Sokoto, Medjugorje, and Kano. They were headed by Prince Pass and Prince. But I thought it had been established in Joss in, uh, in and Hillary. Musuka established in Calabar, Portland. Professor Tamano was principal at Elori, uh, but when he was appointed VC by the Professor Kuku became principal and later VC. In the background, the founding VC was Professor TK, who took over from uh, Professor Bellamy of the UCH body, which was a branch of the University of London. Professor Ayondele was principal in Josh, but Professor Gilbert of Monaguchi became the best, first VC. In 1975 to 78, and was succeeded by our own professor E.U. Imamo from 1978 to 1985. We pay honors to our late professor Imamo, our former leader of the Committee of the Elders, and uncle to our vice chancellor. <laughs> that's Bayero, that's uh, Okay. In line with the Third National Development Plan of 1975, these college campuses transmitted to independent and autonomous universities in 1977 as the second generation universities in Nigeria. Government also stopped individual universities admitting students independently and created a joint admission matriculation program, which was to process admissions into universities. Providing the basis score of 50%, that is 200 or 400, has been a qualifying score. With schemes like quota system or educational disadvantage to bring in less qualified people. We now have situations in Nigeria where high scoring qualified candidates are denied admission for less qualified Nigerians because of the first centralization. AKA, Ms. Somar, a GKM, where you are forced to improve the good score, which would normally have first education. Government also abolished the A-level agency system, replacing it with the 6334 educational system, so that all university, all students move from secondary school to universities, having passed the basic jam. We thus now have less mature students who have little or no voice in public affairs, let alone influence government decisions. In the early days, the universities were truly universal, as represented by staff and students. The staff was international. I'll give you an example in Benin. The VC was Professor Glenn Phillips. The head of engineering was Professor Smith. Library was Professor Harris. Pathology was Professor Kenneth Hill, who became VC after Glenn Phillips. Mathematics was led by Dr. Bashpa Arinia. And Dr. Keshe was in chemistry alongside Nandina academics like Professor Wankov. In ABU Zaya, 
Professor Ishaya Rudu, a Northern Christian, was missing. And Dr. Chris Adashia was dean of students. Is that in a bit? That won't take place today. Virtually all the heads of department, the faculty of medicine in Zaria, were experts. The dean of medicine was Professor Scarborough. The head of medicine was Professor Pari. Pathology was Professor Edgington. Anatomy was Professor Bonnie. Physiology was Professor Watson. Biochemistry was Professor Holloway. Not only here to others, we have students from India, Pakistan, Ghana, Gambia, and even the UK. So the universities were truly international. The universities' communities were also fully autonomous communities, which had everything a community needed. The staff would live all their lives in the university town or community. The university community had accommodation for all our staff, both senior and junior staff. The junior staff in the UI were located in Abadina village with everything there, including schools, a market, a health center. For the senior staff, there was a staff school and an international secondary school, ISI, which was a very prestigious secondary school in the country. In the University of Ibadan, there was a supermarket, King's Western, and the university even had a cemetery. Of course, there was a church and a mosque with chaplains and imams who catered for spiritual well-being. Thus, Ibadan was an international center of academic activities of top range, not only in the Commonwealth, but in the whole world. This was the same concept used to establish most of the food. Okay, thank you. But these gradually diminished after the country's independence. When lecturers went on strike in 1973, and General one head of state, ordered them out of their accommodation on campus, most had nowhere to go, and so the strike had to be called off. That began a situation where academic staff started looking outside for money to build their own houses. Fast forward to 2023. There are now over 200 universities in Nigeria. 40% federal government owned, 44% state government owned, and 74% privately owned, with all virtually 100% Nigerian staff and students, mainly local, if not in this life. While the development largely represents progress in terms of access to university education with residual benefit on the population, there have been some drawbacks. In my time as a student, through the six years of undergraduate training, I lived in a single room for more than half of the time. It was only in Abu Zara that three of us shared the last size room in Rivadmo on the first year. It was Abu was my roommate in Zara. And we used to make a lot of noise. We were well fed in the university cafeteria. Using new tickets which were issued on payment of school fees, our beds were changed and best paid daily by university workers. Off campus accommodation was unknown, virtually unknown. There is need for more private public participation in the provision of accommodation and other facilities of the campus. The associations need to and can do more in helping to provide infrastructure as well. Kudos to this administration for efforts. Many of the projects you see on campus are due to PPP. In my time as a student, fees were charged, but there were many scholarship awards for brilliant students, both by federal and state governments, industries, Shell, as Colicolas, Glaxo. There were mostly awards on student loan schemes by federal government, which were to be recovered in subsequent appointments by the graduate beneficiaries. These schemes were left to die, and no determined efforts made to recover students' loans, which were meant to be recovered, as is done in most parts of the world. These were consequences of the so called world war, or shall I say, world war. In my time as a student, university administration seemed easy to us from afar. Though as the system went through, went indigenous, we later heard of the court truth competition for the high office of the VC. 
I don't know. The Palmyra Vision, let's say, Oleg was what Professor Eddie and Joku, who set up the developmental agenda. But political approval for a second term appointment was linked with ethnic crisis and resulted in the appointment of Professor Saburu Gyobaku, who was later stabbed by a radical student, Kyle Adams, who felt the appointment was unfair and ethically motivated. The struggle moved from Lagos to Ibadan and then to the, through the country. Thank God it has been studied by the replacement of two tenors of four years each by single five year term for the vice chancellor and indeed other principal officers of the university. This seems to have stabilized the system, reducing the international struggle for office. The selection of the last piece of university appears to have been very seamless and university acceptable and universally acceptable. No wonder the peace and development. <laughs> Merit is alive again and needs to be maintained. The single five year term has yet to be extended to the teaching hospitals, where the struggle for the office of the CMD continues to remain fierce amongst the contending colleagues. Now, the teaching hospitals. Over the years, the teaching hospitals started as arms of universities headed by provost of the College of Medicine of the appropriate University, who continued to discharge his duties fully in the university. The director of administration of the hospital, who replaced the hospital governor of the colonial period, had swing in place of the provost when he attended to university matters, which was time for soon. This continued even after the teaching hospitals were moved from the Ministry of Education, which controlled universities, to health. Due to the lapses of that, and complaint from stakeholders, Decree 10 of 1985 was promulgated, which separated the teaching hospital from the university and made the CMD position different from the provost. The CMD was thus required to obtain legal of options from the university for the full-time job for the hospital. This has improved hospital services. The membership of the management board of the teaching hospital, which is heavily skewed to the university today is a reflection of when it was part of the university system. In a 12-member board of the teaching hospital, five are from the university. There is no such reciprocal representation on the university council. The various teaching hospitals have greatly expanded their scope of services to the public. Hopefully, they are gradually getting better funding from government and have also become more entrepreneurial in raising funds. Many have engaged in PPP projects to enhance their equipment and quality of service. These developments have occurred in spite of the interprofessional rivalry and quarrels, which are very prevalent. The teaching hospitals are centers for postgraduate medical training, in addition to training of allied medical staff, in addition to their healthcare duties. I advocated. Some are CMDs, 
some are vice chancellors. They were trained in the teaching hospital systems. Now, medical education. The training and production of medical doctors in Nigeria has lagged behind the general growth of the university system. This is partly due to the fact that you need an established teaching hospital to provide the clinical needs of the trainees. After raising the fund to set up a large university, one requires an equally large fund to develop a teaching hospital, making it bodysome, a bodysome task. Natalia King, Obadiah Johnson, John Rando, Obasar, Shapara. The first trained Nigerian, female Nigerian doctor was Dr. Yewande Savage, 1906 to 64. Mother Scottish, father Nigeria, but she did not practice in Nigeria. It is Dr. Elizabeth Abimbola Awoli, reputed to be the first female doctor to practice in Nigeria. She was consultant at Massey Street Hospital. Since then, women lagged behind me. The first set of 14 medical graduates of Ibadan, of which Professor Ambrose Ali was one, had no fear. The first set of 18 medical graduates of UNIMEN, 1976, had one female, Professor Egedosa. My set, the second set, we were 17. We only had three females. All are not pediatricians. However, today, more than 50% of the medical class is female. More than 60% of the medical class. Medical practice. Medical practice has advanced over the years. Since I graduated nearly 50 years ago, certain medical beliefs and treatment paradigms have changed. In my area of practice, Many years ago, habitation was regarded as not requiring treatment. Indeed, the word essential was used to describe hypertension, which was unknown. It was regarded as being essential for the body. <laughs> the American Fortem president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, whose blood pressure was 221 system, was left untreated until he had a stroke and died from it in 1945. He had gone on with high blood pressure of 186, 1 over, since 1939, mm -hmm. developed heart failure and kidney diseases with high blood pressure, which was untreated. His doctor was Admiral Ross McIntyre, and later cardiologist Howard Brown. This was the state of knowledge at the time that deeply rises with the essential. The cause of President Roosevelt's illness demonstrated the natural history of hypertension untreated. Similarly, high blood pressure was said to be common in the Africa from the earliest reports. The earliest reports of high blood pressure in the Africa was after the Second World War. It was thought that Africa did not have high blood pressure. Even in the studies by President Kikube in the 60s, only found 5 to 7 percent people. Today, then hypertension was defined as 160 over 100. Today, hypertension is more common in the Black Africa and more devastating. His prevalence in the community is now between 30 to 49 percent. And drug treatment for hypertension commences with a BP of 140-90 or higher. Indeed, if your BP is more than 130 over 80, we start you on treatment on non-drug therapy, such as restriction, weight and alcohol reduction, and exercises. As the concept of definition and need for treatment has changed, so has the type of drugs changed. Many years ago, Smoking was a common fact, and it was unusual to have young men who had not tasted smoking, even if they were not regular. The quote from the oldest practicing doctor, who is 100 years old now and still practicing neurology, Dr. Howard Tucker, who is also a lawyer. By the way, he took his Ohio bar exam at the age of 67. He said, and I quote, I remember attending medical meetings. Where doctors would, with a cigarette dangling from their mouths tell patients to take off smoking because it would come your appetite. Today, we now know that cigarette smoking leads to cancer, stroke, heart disease. Luckily, today, smoking rates in adults have declined significantly. But let's show about youth who unfortunately seem to replace cigarette smoking with electronic means like shisha. Surgery, direct and open surgical operations are giving way to percutaneous approaches to surgical correction and keyhole operation. So patients can leave hospital in 24 hours rather than stay in hospital for several months. <laughs> My friend Professor is here with those keyhole surgery. Coronary artery bypass has given way to angioplasty. Heart valves are being replaced percutaneously without holes in the heart are now being closed from outside. 
Direct prostatectomy has given way to TURP, laser treatment, and now robotic prostatectomy. Many abdominal and kidney operations are now done in this country. Catheters are now sent to the heart brain from the groin or forearm to extract clots as in when their heart attacks go or pulmonary embolism. Medical practice is truly dynamic and requires training, retraining, and retraining. It's an important instrument which helps the doctor to diagnose disease by interpretation of sound. However, changes are now taking place. The stethoscope is being gradually replaced by the butterfly IQ ultrasound device. This portable instrument, which can be held around the neck, has more than 100 times the capability of the stethoscope. It is attached to an iPhone or an iPhone phone to scan the heart and blood vessel to determine cardiovascular disease.
very simple. Normally, when you chair the camera, all you are hearing is zip, 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 confusing everyone. And so I now have the responsibility of breaking it down so that it is town and gown. But he has made my this very simple because he has taken us successfully through changes that have occurred over the years in the practice of medicine from admission to the practice. But we, on our own side, we have a few take homes. First, I want to tell the lecturers and the public that under my watch, the teaching hospital is also having a wonderful center for child health that we are also taking there. And we are also taking uh, the block for lecturers, offices, also to the teaching hospital. So I want when I leave, you remember and name one street after me, mm. Professor Salafi Street. So uh, the lecturer has really ginger us to put in more into the uh, you know, uh, teaching of the profession, medicine. And I think uh, I'm happy that the provost was taking notes as well as the dean, so that we look at our curriculum again to be sure that we infuse all these new changes that are occurring in the practice of medicine, especially the keyhole one. And I think I'm so, when I watch them on TV, I think we should start doing that even within us here. So distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am sure you've had a good lecture and please, for you, take care of yourself, especially your cardiac situation. I thought the lecturer was going to tell us everything about our heart, but instead he became a historian today. So thank you so, so very much for coming and so please, we will definitely thank you all. Valedictorian lecturer to step on stage as Vice Chancellor presents the plaque, the valedictory plaque to him. And yeah, while we do that, permit me, Madam Vice Chancellor, to take some recognitions of the dignitaries here present. So many VIPs, but oh, please will forgive me, this is in no particular order. Welcome very special. I'm sure the head of Obaso and family should also come on stage. Please come on stage, sir, and that's Professor Emmanuel Obaso. Welcome, sir. Please put your hands together for these wonderful family members, his wife, Mrs. Orubumi Obaso, the children, Dr. Mrs. Erusogie Ezekiel, Mrs. Erusogie Obaso, Mrs. Osaze Obaso, Dr. and Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. the father, the son in law, Mr. Sazer Ezekiel, the grandchildren are also here. Osa Yona Nima, Osa Yimare, and the widow, Sir Ezekiel. You are all most welcome. We welcome very special. As I urge you to put your hands together for the former governor of the North State, to John Akiko Yenu, welcome, sir. We welcome also the Tar Supreme Court Justice. President Anglican Dalsan Council of Knights, Honorable Justice Samson Waifu. Welcome, my Lord. Welcome the CMD of UBTA, Professor Darlington of Asaki. Welcome, sir. Welcome the Vice Chancellor of Binadion University of Kada, Professor Lawrence Zimonye. Welcome, sir. Welcome the former Vice Chancellor of Arcade University, Professor Emeritus Andrew Onoke Rorai. Welcome, sir. Welcome, Professor Emeritus John Dene. Welcome, Professor Emeritus and Mrs. Raymond de Blago. Welcome, Professor Emeritus Louis Ojobo. Welcome, former CMB UPTH, Professor Eugene Opere. Welcome, sir. Welcome, former Provost College of Medicine, Professor Bishop Vincent Yahweh. Welcome, President of the World Medical Association. 
located within is his wife, the former medical, the former DVC administration unit then, Professor Adesu Wawusaho. Welcome the managing director of Basu and Nature Park, Sir Andrew Ehanire. Welcome the former president, customary court of appeal, Honorable Justice and Professor Mrs. Otago Olubo. Welcome. Welcome Professor Frank Imaria Ben. Welcome, sir. Welcome Professor Andrew Edo. Welcome Professor Vincent Ayer. Professor Edwin Albert, Shepherd Chairperson. University's Admission Board, we welcome you. Welcome Professor Jennifer Ebebe. We welcome Professor and Mrs. Patrick Minovia. We welcome Professor Musa Ilafona. We welcome Director of Admin, UBTH, Jim Wajai Esquire. We welcome the CMAC, UBTH, Professor Stanley Bokubo. We welcome DCMAC Clinical Services, Dr. Mrs. Amina Okagu. We welcome DCMAC Research and Ethics, Dr. Mrs. Esohe Bawadong, welcome to CMAC training and monitoring Dr. Fidelis Dogo. Welcome Head Nursing Services UBTH, Mrs. Doris Asana. Welcome Professor Moses Momo, who is warming up for his own valedictory lecture this year. Welcome you very special, sir. Welcome all road scholars and colleagues, as well as former students of the valedictory lecturer. We welcome the very Reverend Father Dr. Michael Oyanofo. Welcome, sir. We welcome Parish Priest St. Paul's Catholic Church, Reverend Father Dr. Edwin Omorobe. We welcome the former matron at UBTH, Mrs. Irene Nasabota. Welcome, Auntie. We welcome the wife of my daddy and former DIG of police, Mrs. Pari Osayan. We welcome you especially. We welcome those. Oh, the Benin Chiefs from our Royal Palace, Noba Boa of Benin, Chief Ken Otelekwe. Welcome, Chief. Welcome the Oba Kawaii of Sebu, Chief Professor E.J. Ebosen. We welcome the Owele of Asaba, Chief Dr. Chris Chukura. Welcome, Chief. Welcome, Abaku Balogu of Ibadan. High Chief Taiwo Oyeko. Welcome all members of the Committee of Benin Elders. Welcome, retired permanent secretary at those state, my dear uncle, Mr. Dan Hine. Welcome, sir. We welcome Professor I. Edwoman, Justice and Mrs. Olimai Yagi. We welcome you. We welcome retired permanent secretary, Delta State Civil Service, Dr. Mrs. Fumi Lion Omoraka. We welcome you. We welcome Professor Paul Adobane. We welcome Professor Koje. We welcome Professor. <laughs> Welcome to you. But we welcome you again, sir. Professor Andrew Nakar Rai, former Unibank Vice Chancellor. Welcome, Professor Yasu, ex provost. I have done that already. Distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen, that's how we conclude the seventh valedictory lecture of the University of Bibi.